What's up, Andrew? What's up, C Money? It feels like we just spoke. I don't. Why would it feel like that? <laughs> I don't know. There's some time travel that we're doing. It seems like where we're like we may or may not have spoken live 45 minutes ago, but yeah, here we are again. But in that 45 minutes, I just locked down the first sponsor for Ruby Radar. So, oh, that's awesome. There you go. So what's the sponsorship for the newsletter like? Is it like for jobs or a product or something? So if you can't announce it. I'm trying to decide if I can. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's, it's a company called Expedited Security and they have articles and stuff that they want to link to that. I mean, they have a product on the Heroku marketplace that helps you kind of mitigate like security disasters. Like if you get attacked or stuff like that and stuff that I'm not super versed in, but I think it's important to talk about security. And I don't think we talk about it enough in the Rails community. So that was one thing that Colin and I were like, oh, this would be a great sponsor. They have like a blog and great content on security that I think people will benefit from hearing. So they're going to send us a link every week and we'll put in the newsletter. And that's what very cool. about. Yeah, I think security is one of the least areas of focus for a lot of developers because frankly, it's hard enough just to get a feature to work half the time, you know? Right. And then on top of that, you got to make it secure. And yeah, the easy thing is to rely on Rails built-in encryption or strong params or all those like things that are built into Rails. And honestly, you don't have to worry too much about most things, which is nice, but it doesn't right. mean you shouldn't understand why they're CSRF tokens and why you need them and... All of that stuff still matters because a lot of Stack Overflow posts like to say, hey, you know what? Just disable that SSL yeah, yeah. verification and you know, that nonsense. So, <laughs> yeah, I had a discussion with a coworker yesterday. They were like, for some reason, I'm getting like an invalid auth token issue and CSRF token issue. And I was like, okay, whatever you do to mitigate that error is probably going to be a hack and like something we probably shouldn't do. So it was kind of like interesting to see because like, yeah, my first instinct too would be like, oh my God, I got this stupid bug. How do I disable this? But then you, right, but right. I think that's why it's good that we know about security stuff because I'm like, no, don't hack around this. Let's do this correctly. And yeah. the more we all learn about security, the more we can do that. They offer like products around like, I think their main one is like from not attackers in the system, but like outside. So they start pegging your system and, you know, sending you like, they basically DDoS you, but they do it from a bunch of different IP addresses. So every single time they hit your site, it clears your cache. And then they're like, hey, hit us up on Bitcoin if you want this to stop. Maybe a, a concentrated attack is coming from a certain country. They can help you like stop that and stuff as well. So pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. That's a great for a sponsor. And how many weeks have you been live? Like two, three? Nah, more than that. This week will be our sixth. Sixth? Oh my gosh. Time is... Dude, time. What the heck? I, That's insane. I thought I it was my, like a couple weeks, but no. No. <laughs> and I was looking through my notes when preparing for this. And yesterday I wrote, I can't believe it's July. <laughs> <laughs> I stand yeah. behind that statement. It's so crazy to me because we have all this like stuff going on for the house. And like it'll be like, oh yeah, we talked to that person like two weeks ago. And no, it was like a month or two months ago right. instead. And it's so hard to keep track of all that stuff. I want to give a quick random shout out to Adam McCree, who's the developer behind uh, Rails Autoscale for Heroku. She shout was out. just on Startups for the Rest of Us talking about growing the product over the past three years or whatever. And it's, I think he said he, he started developing it five years ago. But it hit uh, 300000 in annual revenue, which is awesome. Nice. So uh, if anybody's interested, we'll have a link to that episode in the show notes. It's really awesome to see a product doing that well. I think he's the only person developing it. So that's a great amount of revenue for one. If not, if he has some help, like it's still plenty of profit there, which yeah, is great. Sustainable business and everything. That's awesome. What else is uh, new with you? What is new with me? Not much. Like, I just can't believe that I've been in Phoenix for a month and a half. I just feel like I haven't done anything. I mean, I've been that busy. That is crazy. Yeah, it is. 
there's not a lot new with me. I'm trying to like get some stuff done, some projects done, which kind of made me realize I'm like, maybe I'm just burnt out a little bit. And I think I am just a smidge. So yeah. deal with that. It's always Are you talking with. work projects, side projects? Mostly side projects, but like there's a project at work I've been working on that's been kicking my butt recently, but it's almost done. So I'm hype about that. But I don't know. I haven't been taking care of myself like I need to, which I am aware of. So I'm just kind of <laughs> tired. Just kind of yeah. tired. I hear that. I felt that way quite a bit lately. I feel like I'm doing better now that like the masks and all the bands and stuff are kind of done here in in town. So like just going out to eat for dinner, I couldn't believe how much I miss doing that. Just sitting there for sitting somewhere else, you know, for an hour. It was was just nice to do. And I feel like that sort of stuff has been helping. But between just regular old work burnout and having a pandemic on top of that, I'm sure that there's been like an obscene amount of people who feel very burnt out this past year. So, yeah, well, especially with all the stuff that's been happening in our society, like compounded on top of that. Yeah, it's been hard for everyone. But I don't know. (laughs) Bright days on the horizon. Question mark? Probably not. Well, I'm not. I'm looking forward to uh, in about two weeks, we'll be on our way down to Florida. I've never been to Disney, so that will be interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be nice to get away for a couple weeks and just not do anything. Become a Florida man to see how they live. Yeah, I'll be in the newspaper. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Man attacks alligator with bare hands. (laughs) It feels like it's been an extremely long time since I've had a vacation that long. It's probably been like three years or something because we've done some short, long weekends, like four days or whatever, but not like two weeks. And that's going to be really nice. I think my goal is to find some book to listen to. We're going to drive down a road trip. So I think we're going to try and find some audio books and, you know, just get some other perspective going through the brain as I drive down there. So yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it. One of my hacks for dealing with like this feeling is that I go get a massage, which is not something I do as a person unless I'm like, oh, you know what would really be great right now is a massage. <laughs> unless Either it's d- dire. <laughs> right. But like, and when you do that, I don't know, you just feel like a whole person after that. It's rejuvenating. And I also do occasionally... I do the like float therapy where I like lock oh, myself yeah. in a pod and like float in water in complete darkness and silence for like an hour. <laughs> I love that. I've never done that, but the idea of it sounds awesome. It's got to be a, in a way like a forced meditation. You're yeah. going to be just floating there. Like you're going to have to sit and think for an hour. And yeah, I find I like to do a headspace like guided meditations and those are, mm-hmm. you know, equally awesome. And I kind of feel like driving and listening to an audio book or something. Yeah, I'm listening to the book, but then it starts getting me into these trains of thought and just thinking about like stuff that I don't on a a day-to-day basis. That reminded me of one. So at a previous job, we had the company fly to Germany for like minimum of two weeks, but half the company stayed for like a month. And I was there for a month. And I remember this like because I can't talk to people, right? Like I don't know German, so I can't even like order food or anything. And when they're asking for me to, you know, it's $30 for whatever you're buying. Like, I don't know what they said. And like, here, is this enough money? But that, that experience was like awesome. Cause I remember like at one point, just thinking about my life back in the U S and I, I would like visualize it as if I was playing a video game, looking from above. And watching myself like walk to the office and everything. And it was just really refreshing to have that like out of context ability to look at my own life and be like, yeah, that's not healthy. And that's not healthy. And I should change this and whatever. And there's just something about being able to like get yourself in one of those places where you can think about things that way. Because I feel like a lot of the burnout for me is just like, I don't have time to analyze how things are going. A lot of times, like I just got a bunch of work to do and you don't have time to be like introspective about it. So 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we live in routines, right? And if being introspective about your life is not built into your routine, then it's going to take getting out of your routine in order to like have that happen. Yeah. Like you'll see pleasure point. is self-help books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like a good uh, self-help book sometimes. It depends on like the style that it's written and stuff, but right. I don't know if you would consider mastery self-help, but that, that book was like, hit me at the right time in my life. And I listened to that kind of on repeat for a couple months, you know, and sometimes those are just what you need at that point in life. So it was funny because Paul named this, the episode that just went out today, but how to win friends and influence people is one of my favorite books. <laughs> yes. I love that book. Any of those that are like books written a very long time ago that are still popular, you can guarantee mm-hmm. that they're good books. Yeah, for sure. It may sound like a self-help book and you might think it's not going to be good, but it is. There's a reason why it's stuck around for so long and it's still popular. Are you reading anything? No, but actually a friend of mine is mailing me a book. What was it called? How Buildings Work by Stuart oh, Brand. I haven't read cool. that one before. It's supposed to be really good. How buildings work. Yeah, I forget the premise of it or whatever, but the natural order of architecture. Yeah, I'm kind of excited about that, especially because I'm in the middle and process of building a house. But I feel like all of the home building stuff and construction and all of that is so similar to building software that it may be technically other things that you're worried about, but you can draw so many correlations between them, especially with project management and all that too. Yeah. I'm excited to give that a read. Very cool. I'm still slowly working my way through metaprogramming Ruby, but I'm also starting to read how to take smart notes. Mm, Yeah. Taking notes is that. Don't take me down this road. Yeah. We could go on and on for that, but yeah, the notebooks full of like things I wrote down and we'll never read again still somehow help organize my thoughts and yeah. it's worth it. For me, like just getting ideas out of my head is something I realized is much more important than I have realized in the past. Because of my backseat driver with having ADHD, it's just like you get into like these endless thought loops and just getting out of your head and like suddenly it's just not there anymore. It's like, it feels so relieving. And because like I've moved from like idea to, to idea, it's like once... I get the thing out, then it's gone and then I can move on and it feels so good. Yeah. There's something about that where like, if you write it down, you feel like it's safe to forget because Mm -hmm. you know where you can reference it. It's like compressing images where you're like, Hey, I'm going to write this color down and then I can always go look the color up later and I don't have to like have it right here with me. And you can just go do that for every color in the image and compress it and that's what you're doing to your brain. You're like almost defragmenting it or compressing your knowledge or something yeah. that way. It's cool. Yeah. What I started doing in the car sometimes is like, I'll turn like the Apple voice memo thing on and just talk oh. to myself in the car for like hours. I have countless amounts of those and I really want someone to transcribe them so I can just turn them into blog posts. Cause I feel like there's been so many times where I'm just driving and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to record this. I don't know. Just go on a a random train of thought and just explain what you're thinking. And I always intend to go back through and listen to them and turn them into a blog post, but I never do. Maybe that's a service we could build. A little app that you could have run through speech to text or something with Google's API and spit out your blog posts. Yeah, it sends you a PR. Cool. That's a good idea. We'll it opens just the PR connect it directly to, to GitHub. <laughs> I mean, you could do that pretty easily with like Apple shortcuts and stuff. Honestly, it wouldn't be super hard Probably, to do that. Especially, yeah. There's a bunch of cool apps that I've found recently that do stuff like that. Like there's one I use for like quick capture. It's called Drafts. And I have it on my phone and my watch as like, and my iPad is like a prominent button. It's just a plus button that just adds a note. And I just drop whatever I'm thinking at the exact second. But on my watch, I can... Tell Siri, I just hit, I have it on my home screen. I just hit a button and start talking and it uses voice to text to like write out what I'm thinking. And just as soon as I stop talking, it just saves the note. And it's like a, just a a folder just adds all your quick capture. So then I'll go back through and look at the notes. And when I'm 
kind of like uh, curating and I'll either add them into my obsidian thing or I just delete them. Yeah, I like that. I definitely should do something like that because anytime I'm like out walking the dog or something or have a thought, like I'll try and record it, but I need something to actually just convert it to text for me. And then it's practical and usable instead. And the best part about this is like, I don't use this for note taking. Like this is specifically an app that I use just to dump a thought, like the quickest way Mm -hmm. possible to dump a thought from my head to this thing. It's great. I like it. Have you seen my Obsidian published thing? You can go to notes.andrewm.codes now. And I've got like a whole thing and I've got like thousands of notes, I think kind of on the back end that aren't public yet. But when I have something that I want to like quickly share, I've started using this database basically. Huh? Yeah. I haven't seen this, but this looks awesome. I'll have to play with that because that sounds pretty nifty. There's something about the whole, like I would love to write more and stuff, but, and writing in and of itself is very good for being able to think out things thoroughly and everything. I have to record all these little prompts for me. And then when I get the time to actually sit down and fully think through that and turn it into a blog post, just having those like little nuggets of like, okay, we can capture this thought and then you can like reference it later. It's fascinating how much of that we can do now in a really efficient way. It used to be like, I'd save it somewhere or like email myself a, a thought. And then it's gone forever. You know, I'll never find it again. But the like ease of breaking down all those barriers of you want to be able to write blog posts and you can't just, unless you're pretty good and train yourself to like come up with ideas every day or something, it can be hard to come up with like, what should I blog about? I'm in junior dev. Like, I don't know anything yet. What should I blog about? But like, if you're actually working on a project and struggle with something and you catch yourself and you say, Hey, it took me more than four hours to figure out this solution to this. I should write a blog post about it because I couldn't find the answer Googling it so far. But now that I've figured it out, I could write a blog post on it. And that's how I started writing my like Ruby and Rails and Python and coding blog posts. And that was really valuable. Yeah, I've started to do that. And I've started to write like a lot more, not necessarily publishing all of it, but I've started writing a lot more. And I think learning more about how to take better notes is like the first step to like being good at this and then finding like the tool that works for you because there's like a bajillion of them. But what I've started doing, I'm a big Obsidian user. I think Obsidian is perfect for me because I've tried every note-taking app out there. I promise you I've tried them all. And Obsidian is the only one that's ever stuck for me. And what my kind of workflow is because Obsidian allows you to use all these things and it's easy to write like plugins for it is extensible. It's, I don't know, it's like, I think it's the perfect tool for developers and it has templates. So every time I'm starting to do something and I'm like, oh my God, this would be great to write down. I just hit a button in Obsidian and it uses a template. And then I just start either dropping in images or GIFs or like just like quick notes. And then I hear this idea of like having, it's called like evergreen notes. It's a whole thing that I'm not going to, go down into right now. But instead of having a note, this is called Ruby. And then you just like put stuff in that note. Instead of having these very broad topic notes, I make the notes atomic as possible. So the first note I just opened up right here is how to record and share your terminal with ASCII cinema, enema, whatever it is. And I literally just jotted down a few notes and took like a few screenshots, like as I was setting it up and then using view component with Bridgetown and structured data image objects. And like these things and versatile functions with Ruby. And even if I'm not actually doing it, if I think it would be a good blog post, like I'll create the note and it'll just be empty. And then I'll go back, use a system to like organize it and stuff. So I'll just go back to all my notes that have a certain tag on them. It indicates the state of it basically in my system. And if I go back to it, I'm like, oh, this was cool, but I don't really want to do anything with it. I'll just delete it and just keep moving. But or if I start working on something again I'll, and I have a, a note about it, I'll just go back and keep adding in notes and then I will eventually turn into a blog post and put it on my blog. I love that. I do the same thing. Most of mine are just here in Apple Notes. Well, but- Apple Notes got a big <laughs> upgrade in Monterey and the new iOS 15. Oh, cool. I'm excited about that because yeah, so it's, it's, it got a lot it's of very stuff. average right now, but my notes in the past have been using like, do you ever hear of notational velocity? Yeah, I think so. 
it was like an old app for the Mac that it works very similar to Apple Notes, where it's like the first line of your note automatically becomes a title. And like you can just write text in there and it will, when you search, it searches the whole thing. So I have a whole bunch of those just random things like, if entrepreneurs need increasingly less money, how do you invest in them? It was like a random thought I had a while back. It was like, yeah, it's just a good question. Like if, if you can't invest money into a startup because it's one person and they don't want to take money, what do you do? And like all kinds of random little things like that. Lots of like programming ones too. But I like to kind of organize them. Like these could be blog posts or these are just interesting discussion topics to have with friends or something or Ruby or whatever it is. Yeah. I think that's why yeah. Obsidian and a bunch of other tools are starting to like add this to it. This idea of backlinks is a really easy way to like link to another note. The mm-hmm. syntax is usually like double brackets, double square brackets. And I think that's been like the game changing like feature that got me to be like better at writing notes because yeah, what you were saying, like you have all these ideas, but like maybe on Apple Notes specifically, like if you've already taken a note about something or you want to write a blog post, but like you already explained like something in another note, there's no way to like basically just refer to it. You have to write it again. I kind of view that like debt in your like technical debt in your notes. And that's been like a big thing for me is like I have a lot of blog posts where at the very beginning I'm like, okay, first we're going to like create a new Rails app. But because of that, it's kind of stupid to have that. But I want it to be there for juniors. So since I've kind of evolved my ideas around note-taking now, when I create a blog post, I'm like, okay, we need a Rails app. I'll just link to a smaller post. And Obsidian allows you to create those those references and find those connections. And that's been really helpful. Kind of wiki-like in a sense. Yeah, that's kind of how I do it in a very wiki-like nature. Because like the hard part of taking notes is like, I don't know how to take notes. I'll just copy someone else's thing. I think that's how a lot of people start. And when you copy someone else's stuff, it's just like copying someone else's code. Like you don't know like how they got there. You know, you kind of have to like find your own system. And once you kind of find it, you just should roll with it. <laughs> and creating like wiki styled like notes is what works for me. Especially I create a lot of lists or st- like kind of step based stuff. So I don't know. I've been having a lot of fun with this like on my personal time. Yeah, I feel like I don't know. Just being able to remember stuff as a programmer is just such a useful thing. You know, if it's as simple as like, you need to remember that, hey, in this old project, we solved this problem because you came across the same problem like four years later. Just even knowing where to look for things is like invaluable. So there's a volume of stuff you need to know, all this Ruby, all this Rails, JavaScript, Git. You just have like a countless amount of things. And so being able to do Good note taking just makes a world of difference, I feel like. It does. Especially our brain is not built as a storage device. Our brain is really good at making connections, but it's not a storage device. You're not good at remembering things. So yeah. finding like how to play to that uh, strength of like, you know that you're good at making connections, but not at remembering things. So building a system for yourself where it's easy to like put things quickly so that you don't have to remember them. And then later you come back and you build your connections. Yeah, it always amazes me that some of the biggest companies these days are so trivial. For example, like Google search, it's not trivial to implement, but the concept is pretty simple. It's like, hey, here's all this information. Go help me find something because God knows I can't go look through it all myself. And then you have like Slack and Intercom, just ways of sending text to another person. And they are still very simple. And yet, like, that is the foundations of what we need as human beings. It's fascinating. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, HoneyBadger.io. One of the things that's really tricky about error monitoring is that when you get an error, it could have come from anywhere. It could have come from a background job or a user doing some weird thing. They have JavaScript turned off. You never know. And so you might get these stack traces, but you might not know how to debug them. And that is really a pain in the butt. So Honey Badger has a really cool feature called breadcrumbs. And you can integrate their client side and server side libraries so that you can track what was going on when an error occurred. 
So for example, you have a front end, it has a button to go sign up, your user clicks that and it makes a post request to your API and your API has a failure response. And then your JavaScript has an error because, well, something went wrong on the back end. Well, what's really cool is that you're able to track all of that with Honey Badger and see the steps that actually happened in the browser and the server side. So you can go replicate those steps and try it yourself and actually replicate those errors and actually solve the bugs. And that is super cool because If you're just trying to look at the stack trace and you don't know what happened that led to that, it's really tough. So Honey Badger can really save you a bunch of time. I think that is one of my favorite features that they offer. And, you know, like we've said before, they have check-in monitoring. So if you've got cron jobs or like regular scheduled background jobs or anything like that, you can have those check in with Honey Badger and make sure that they're running so you can feel confident that, yes, your cron jobs actually are running. So that's it. I just wanted to give them a shout out. We love Honey Badger and they've been a long, long time supporter of everyone in the Rails community and they will continue to be. So check them out. They've got a generous free tier. There's really no reason not to use them. I made this note the other day. Have you realized that like a lot of companies very recently have gotten very popular and you know what they are? A freaking CSV inside of the browser with a nice a nice UI and like integrations. And like I think integrations is like the key to the game, like especially as no code gets more popular. You have mm-hmm. to have integrations and whoever has the most integrations is going to come out on top. But like Airtable is just a CSV on the internet. <laughs> like what is this? And it yeah. gets me so frustrated because I'm like, I could do this, but I didn't. Right, right. That's what I think is super interesting about we do have people building complex things. And yet like the things that end up often being the most like widespread, they're like these simple things of like, guess what? We've had spreadsheets forever, but you put it on the internet and you connected it with these external tools, which for example, Google Sheets didn't really make easy, but had they integrated with Zapier, it could have been totally different or whatever. And you're like, how is that the like fast growing startup that it is. You're like, there's not that much new. And I feel like every time I'm trying to come up with a product idea, I'm like, how do I find that? Or how do I find something that has already been done before? Like Slack, IRC already existed and all these other chat systems did too, but they improved those things that needed to be improved. But how do you see those? Like, how do you see those opportunities? Because they're so in your face because you're already using something just like it, but slightly worse. And then that comes along and you're like, oh, why didn't we have this forever? And you're like, what? Like, how come I couldn't see that? It's fascinating. Like for me, I think the easiest way to like come up with product ideas is to like start using popular no code apps right now. Or because as soon as you like try to do something that you can't figure out how to do, there's your idea for a simple app. I'm trying to think of like how to work without code, but to accomplish the things you would accomplish with code. I think that's mm-hmm. like the kind mm-hmm. of space I see like really booming right now. Yeah. And like Zapier and stuff are worth. Zapier is uh, a great. Zapier, IFTT, automate.io. There's yep. a few more that are really good. And again, there, those only work if they have integrations with everything. So if anything, right. like having like a solid API is becoming more and more important for you to survive. A company Agreed. that wants to like, get users, I think. Yeah, it's a way for you to, as a developer, you have a limited amount of time and resources. But if you implement a robust API that doesn't have to be that complicated, it just needs to integrate and do the simple operations and you connect it with Zapier, you know, you can be the sender of webhooks and the recipient and you probably need both. But if you can do that, It's unbelievable what people can use your product for that you could never take the time to like go build that special thing. And they'll build things for you. And that makes a world of difference. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the long-term goals that I have for Jumpstart is I want to have it built in with the ability to send and receive webhooks with Zapier and then just set up some sort of like routing system for you to like 
say, hey, I want to subscribe to these events or, you know, publishing this stuff needs to include this data or whatever. And just kind of have some sort of system built in. But hard part is I haven't built that integration with Zapier before. So I need like an example to actually set up so that I can play with it and like figure out, you know, how would I architect that? Because right now I can look at the stuff and be like, yeah, I don't know how to add value. Or, you know, the layer of abstraction wouldn't be worthwhile until I could comprehend like, okay, we should do it this way and that will simplify X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, it'll just be another nonsense on top of that. So More noise. Yeah. So if you're using Jumpstart Pro and want to integrate with Zapier, I guess you should hit me up and we'll talk about that. And that could be a good use case for me to use to, to figure that feature out. So, and that's happened with quite a few little things like the two factor auth was a customer was setting it up and I've tried to set up with devise two factor and stuff in the past, but those are a little tricky because they're like, you have to go look up at some point whether or not to ask for the two factor code, but you can't do that until they put their email in. So you either have to ask for email and password and then not really sign them in and then go back through the process and like ask for the two factor auth or you have to ask for their email and then show another form like Google does where it's like email, hide that, then show the password and the two factor. And I think the device two factor gem was, we want you to really submit all three at once. And I was like, I don't want to store this stuff in session or in cookies or anything. Not good. So we went through that a few iterations and figured out, you know, let's just do it from scratch and look at how that gem works and we'll go and make it smoother. And that's turned out to be really good because I can help somebody build a feature, but then everybody gets the feature as well, which is really cool. So hit me up if you need a Zapier integration. If you hit me up, hit Chris up, you hit me up, I'm going to send you a link to the Zapier gem and then call it a day. (laughs) Uh, I might do that too. We'll just surprise (laughs) them. (laughs) <laughs> like, congrats, you can already do this. Did you see that tweet from Patrick from Stripe about Ruby? Yeah. Ruby? 170% faster Ruby, I think specifically was the number that With, jumped out to me. It's like built on Sorbet and MRI and mm-hmm. Ruby. And it yeah. like it's not a just-in-time compiler. It's like actually compiles the code before it runs. But it's not everything, I assume. Right. <laughs> it's hard to understand. I mean, because Shopify and... Stripe are the two that are kind of like leading this movement, I think. Which is interesting being that they're two very big companies built on Ruby. The gist of the tweet was like that they believe that making multi-year infrastructure bets is important and that they've been working on their Ruby stuff. So their in-house Ruby compiler is now 22 to 170% faster than the default implementation and they're hiring. So if you're into like cool high scale Ruby, it sounds like that may be a way to get in there. And it's not JIT, I don't think. Whatever no, happened it's to the not. JIT compiler? I haven't um, heard much talk it's in about there. that recently. It's in three, but it it I still hasn't Rails. It, yeah, it still hasn't really improved Rails's performance. So right, I think it's is it two seven or something added it, but you had to yes. enable it. And yes. then three, is it on by default? I can't remember. I don't remember. think so. I don't think it's on by default. And it may not be on by default because so many Rails apps are out there and it's not faster with it. So Right. Because I think the intention was that it was going to be on, but if it's not providing a enough of an improvement for the majority of apps, it doesn't make sense to be on by default. But yeah. yeah. I want to know if that submarine has JIT enabled. What yeah, the, I forgot that uh, Penelope from Ruby Central tweeted about the thing. The compiler discussed here is the Stripe internal extension of Sorbet. So it's an ahead of time compiler, not another Ruby JIT. Compiler works with MRI, which Stripe has been using in production since the start. So yeah, that is fascinating. Wonder how it takes to. Like how long it takes to compile because I guess you compile it ahead of time, which is interesting too. Then like, because this is like one of my dreams to like merge Ruby and Crystal 
so that we can like compile our app eventually in production, but we have the flexibility of duct typing. So like this sounds like it's going down that path, which just gets me super excited because that will be the day when we can do all that. But yeah, it, it makes you wonder then like, okay, so then we're used to setting up, we got to install Ruby and we've got to do all this stuff. Potentially then this means that it could be a pre-compiled binary that you could just ship to production. So you could like, similar to how you build a Docker image and you deploy that to production, it just runs the image or like a Go application. You could in theory just compile the Go Rails service and throw it up on your server and start it. And then it boots up Ruby. And I guess you would compile it with the Ruby version built in maybe, or in theory, that is an option, but it also might work. Like, have you ever used Python? Yes. I know Python. You know, the, the PyC files that it leaves everywhere. Yeah. Which are annoying. I think they're just in time compiled maybe, but the same thing applies. Like they're that script but it's just a compiled version. So it right. it can reference that and boot up faster. So maybe they're doing something like that as well. That's not like compile it to an executable or whatever, but it sounds like they're going to eventually open source it, but not for a while until it's like right. more stable or something, but it it's stable like enough for find... them to run in. They run yeah. in prod, so it's got to be pretty stable. <laughs> it- it sounds like we need to find some Stripe engineers who kind of want to come talk to us about this. Yeah, that would be fun. Maybe you can have somebody on. So. Yeah, because you're talking like galaxy brain and I'm just not there. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> why would you even want to do that? I don't even know. Why would you uh, want to right, pre-compile a binary of Ruby and stick it on your server? I don't get it. It's the exact same thing that you do with your Docker image, right? So you say, I want yeah, I this Ruby that, like, and why? I want that. Well, so that you have the, <laughs> it's all together and you just run it and you don't have to like, you don't have to do RVM or RBM uh, or any of that stuff. Okay. Like it would have the exact Ruby version it needs and probably all the gems and everything in one file compiled down. And then it would be super fast and, you know, portable that way because you can just take one file and move it around wherever to anything similar to your Docker images. That's an interesting direction that it could go. I know that I tried to use some of the packaging tools for Python way back in the day to make it a Windows executable and mm-hmm. you know a Mac oh, application boy. and stuff. Those don't work very well, or no. they didn't at the time. But that I'm was sure also like 10 years ago too. So yeah, there was like, if you boot it up on Windows, like every le- character of text was a box. You know, because it didn't oh, load nice. the fonts properly. Didn't have and, the correct font, yeah. Yeah. Love so, that. So, yeah, those wonderful things. I, I just love programming, you know? Everything there's works. A, no, nothing No, nothing works. But there's a program for Ruby that was kind of doing the same thing, but I don't think it's very popular anymore. I want to say it was called like Shoelace or something or something Playroom or I don't know. But it would like kind of try to compile your Ruby into like a program that you could execute. Uh-huh. I don't think it worked. I think just like the Python, like it's like, the success of it is very dependent on a lot of factors. Looks like there's Ruby Packer that is trying to do the same thing. And of course, the README has Windows, Mac OS, and Linux builds failing. So, ah, oh, cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, oh. a long time ago, when I was like in high school and stuff, flash drives were just becoming popular and stuff. So, Bro. we had like, yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> I'm dating myself, right? Oh, God. But there was the portable apps community that I got really into, which was like, it was hilarious because what they were doing was taking all these Windows applications and just wrapping them so their config files lived on the flash drive instead of trying to install themselves in like your user folder on Windows. The hilarious thing was they used this tool called NSIS, N-S-I-S, which was like a scripting language for creating like an installer that would go and like put files on your machine and stuff for Windows. So they would use that to like tweak the applications. So they would just save their config files like relative to the flash drive. And that was like such a big popular thing for the longest time. 
because I was in high school and they had the network filtering of like, if you typed in games or whatever, yeah. you know, into the search, it, it would like ban that. So they had a proxy that they had configured, but I grabbed portable Firefox on the flash drive and they must have manually configured Internet Explorer to use the proxy. So Firefox could just go anywhere on the internet that you wanted. So I'm poking around and I find this guy configured Firefox 1.5, version 1.5 of Firefox. This is old. What he, version are we on now to give some context? Oh gosh. Firefox is like 89 upgrading to a newer version. So yeah, 90s maybe. Very old version. But anyways, this guy had uh, he had <laughs> rethemed Firefox with the Internet Explorer icon and like all of the other icons were changed to the match. So I downloaded that and then like shared that with a bunch of my friends and they started using that through school. And I started to hear the teachers like if you see anybody using portable Internet Explorer, bring them to the principal's office immediately. And I'm just like freaking out. Or I like some trouble doing stuff like that as well. <laughs> yeah. We figured out also how to play Counter-Strike from a flash drive and Half-Life, I think, Half-Life 2 even. And yeah, good times. Nothing yeah. like some curious kids poking around the, the school network. I was the kid who like somehow figured out the Wi-Fi password every year. And every year it would reset and they're like, <laughs> hey, Andrew, what's the deal? And then set up all these VPNs to like allow me to like, you know, do whatever I wanted on the internet. So I almost got in big trouble for this, but I'm like interested in security in high school. Right. So we're like, one of my friends has an old Xbox and he was like, if you can hack this, you can have it. So we took it home and we downloaded Linux and then you can unlock the hard drive on the Xbox as long as it's turned on. So you have to power on your Xbox, unplug the data cable and plug it into a computer so that it decrypts the drive while it's on. And then like while it's turned on, you unplug it and plug it into a computer and boot it into Linux to go hack the firmware on there or the operating system. So you can like, you know, run your own operating system and play DVDs and other things and whatever. Right. Backed up games and all that. So we were doing that. But then other security things I was having fun with was like, there's a tool called Kane Enable. And it would install... Very, I know about Kane Enable. Yeah. So it install a network driver and you could monitor the network for anybody typing in passwords to log into the network. Yep. So I'm reading about this on a forum in our computer programming class in high school. And I'm like, that's cool. And I told one of my friends about it. And he's dumb enough to come in the next day with it on his flash drive. And because it installs a network driver, I like disabled the close button on the window. And so he comes in to class and I'm like doing my homework or whatever. He plugs it in and starts running it. And our teacher's going around making sure everybody's doing, doing their work and stuff to. before yeah. she logs in. So she sits down finally and logs in and he freaks out and he like, oh my God. And so of course... Me and like four or five other people roll over to his desk and we're like, what is it? What is it? And the teacher sees too. And she's like, okay, what's going on? So she comes over and he's like trying to close it, but that close button's disabled. So he like minimizes it. And then, then she gets over and it's just his computer with that one program running. And he's looking at the desktop and she's like, yeah, okay, what are you doing? All. <laughs> Not sus at all. You ain't slick. Yeah. So she opens it and sees her password and stuff and then freaks out. And over the next like week, basically what happened is as soon as she sees that, she asks him, who gave this to you? Because she knew he wasn't smart enough to figure it out himself. So he looks at me and he's like, Chris did. I'm like, oh, oh bro. no. You snitch. Like rat it out immediately. Hell no. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I told him about it, but I didn't tell him to use it or I didn't do anything wrong. So what I know is happening over the next week is they're pulling all of the kids out of class to go be interrogated by the principal and stuff, basically to make a case against me because I was like pointed at. So You're the bad I'm, kid. 
I'm just like freaking out because I know something bad's happening or coming down the line. And two of my other friends, they like search their book bags and stuff in their locker. And so they called their lawyer and were threatening to sue the school and school is threatening to sue my friend who had done all this. And I'm just like, oh God, this is bad news. And the parents are starting to talk because one day I get in the car and my mom's like, do you hear what's going on with Zach? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. He did some stupid thing. I'm like, oh God, this is bad. And they never ever like pull me out of class and interrogate me or anything. And it ended up that like they banned him from ever using a school the computer again. I think. And years later, he ends up being the network admin at the school. (laughs) So a good five or six years later or more, probably he ended up in the network admin there. And they were like onto the portable internet explorer stuff and counter-strike. And the best part was after this happened, the network admin started to install VNC and watch us while we're on the computers and we had a Cisco networking class in the morning. So the first day I show up and I'm like, that VNC icon is new, right? Mm -hmm. Click close. And you can tell that he freaks out. So then the next day VNC is running and we can see it in like the task manager, but he's figured out how to hide the icon this time and like Mm -hmm. prevent us from shutting it down. And then like our keyboards have those stupid internet and calculator buttons on it. And it turns out if you like, if you hit the calculator button, it's not smart enough to just show you the existing calculator. It starts up another calculator. And so he's watching me and the screen will go blank as he like takes over and starts viewing my screen. So I can tell when he starts watching me and then I'll just start opening calculators and filling the screen (laughs) and he starts closing them from his computer. And we're just like messing with him and like typing messages to him and stuff. And he's like, get back to work, get back to doing your homework and stuff. And we were just like messing with him for the rest of the year because he's watching me because it, it supposedly is me and I'm the bad kid or whatever, but I didn't do anything. It was hilarious. Here's where you screwed up. (laughs) You told people I did stuff like that in high school, but I didn't tell anyone my crowning achievement. Was well, I did, This was a cooperation with a friend that ended up going to college and being my roommate and then roommate after college as well. So like very good friend. We had a substitute teacher and she didn't really understand how to work the computer. And I was the computer kid. So I cloned the teacher's hard drive onto a flash drive while setting up the movie for the substitute teacher. And that yielded dividends. But we never told anyone about it. It was just me and him because he was like, when he ran a little operation to help me do this. And we ended up getting like the final exam, like for the end of the year, but we didn't even know it. And our teacher at the end of the year was like, just so you know, the exam that I'm going to give you on Friday can be found online. So basically saying it was like an old AP exam or whatever, but it was, but it was like a teacher's edition that you shouldn't have access to. But because I cloned her hard drive, I had that thing. And on the day of the exam, I walked in and I, I walked up to her and I was like, is this the exam? She's like, who did you show this to? And I was like, no one. And she like looked at me and I was like, I didn't. And she's like, all right. And that it was the exam. That's awesome. You reminded me of when we were in grade school. Well, so Zach, who got in trouble in high school, his dad was a, a computer guy at a book bindery. And he had helped set up a bunch of computers for the grade school. And for whatever reason, the computer room's door locked from the inside. So we would like go to the bathroom and then actually go in there and start playing Empire Earth. And like, you know, I think we had some Apple IIe's and we'd play Oregon Trail and stuff, but we just turn the lights off and then lock ourselves in the room. So if the door was locked, the teachers thought there was nobody in there because they had to unlock it and allow us to like have our computer time. But we would just go in there and play video games until we were found. (laughs) Very uh, nice. I need that wow. room in my new house where I can just lock myself in. <laughs> you just lock yourself in. I yeah, I have a spare room. Maybe that's what I need to do. It needs to be my gaming room. Some good times. Good times. Well, now that we've exposed ourselves as 10x black hats, yeah. You got anything else? For real though. I think next call we need to just have with our like 
ski masks on and just wait until yeah. Jason joins the Zoom and be like, I don't know if you know hey, this, but hey, we're Jason. now an anonymous podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, wow, so much fun. Then it was so rowdy those back were, then. Those were the fun days of like, you know, you were doing that just because you wanted to see what you could do. You know, yep. like you're just like learning and seeing Pushing what was bounds. possible. And you didn't have responsibilities with it, which is nice. Like you're not worried about breaking things. You're like trying to break things because that's right. fun. And, you know, you get into building stuff and you're like, now there's a thousand people using this. I can't do any of that because I'm trying to make sure that it works and prevent them from breaking it. And it's just like not... It's not, it's not the same. It's not as fun as it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Responsibilities, I, eh? I, I'm so nostalgic now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> the good old days yeah. of just trying to break stuff. Oh, man. Yep. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. What about you? Yeah, yeah I think so. All right, man. Cool. I'll talk to you All right. sometime. Take care. See ya.